Uh, welcome to day three of our workshop. I'm going to introduce Elran Subag, who's going to talk about optimization of full RSB spherical spin glasses. Um, Elran's from, from Weizmann, and I've been wanting to learn about this stuff for a long time. So take it away, Elran. Thank you, Chris. Uh, and thank you for the organizers for the invitation. Uh, I'm going to talk about a certain optimization problem in a setting uh, somewhat similar to uh, Ahmed's talk, but in the spherical case. And I want to start with the pure models. So uh, these are not exactly the models I will uh, talk about. Uh, the theorem will not be on these models, but these are good for motivation. And these are simply uh, homogeneous polynomials in n variables, x1 to xn. Uh, and I'm going to make a distinction between the degree equal to p equal to and p larger or equal to three. And in both cases, you just define a random function in Rn by, uh, you go over all monomials of this degree and you multiply each of them by uh, an IID Gaussian and you sum. So basically that's the, the most basic way to define a random function in high dimensions. And since these are homogeneous uh, functions, it's enough to understand them on the sphere, on the unit sphere. And what I'm interested in is uh, the question of uh, efficient optimization of such functions on the sphere. And more precisely, what I want to know is whether there exists an algorithm which takes as an input all the coefficients j, it outputs a point on the sphere such that for any small epsilon, the value at the output is the maximum up to multiplicative error of epsilon with probability that it goes to one. And uh, we want to do it in time complexity, which is polynomial in N. For the sake of comparison, if you just want to exhaustively search for such a point to get an epsilon error, you need exponentially many samples. And of course, the case where the degree is two is trivial because you, you just need to understand the matrix. You, this, uh, you can take the symmetric part of this matrix J and uh, you can just look at the eigen decomposition of this matrix and everything will be uh, clear from that. And any silly algorithm will work. For example, the uh, uh, power iteration works in this case. And in the case where P is larger than three, what we believe is this, that there is no such algorithm. Uh, I'll talk later about some hardness results, but uh, of course we don't have results that cover all algorithms. And the caricature is more or less this. If you look at the function in the case of P is equal to two, if I just plot the function such that the distance from the origin uh, is the value at the point on the sphere. This is how it looks in the case where P equal two. And when P is larger than three, it's a much more complex function. And uh, specifically, it has many more critical points. So uh, in, the case, in the case where P is equal to two, you have the critical points are just the eigenvectors and they come in pairs on the sphere. So if, if B is a, an eigenvector, minus B is also an eigenvector. You have with probability one, you have exactly uh, n such pairs, and only one of them correspond to a local maximum. Okay, so roughly speaking, although not technically, but this is roughly a convex uh, optimization problem because you only have one local maximum. And in the case of P is larger than three, we know that there are exponentially in n uh, many local maxima. Most of them, the value at most of them would be far from the global maximum. Uh, this was proved in expectation by Tuka Offinger, Gerard Benarus, and Ilji Czerny. They computed the expected number of local maxima or uh, points of any other index at a given height in expectation. And uh, my contribution was to show uh, using a second moment computation that there is concentration around the expectation. Okay, so I told you about uh, two problems. One is trivial when P is equal to two and the other we assume is too difficult to really optimize. And I wanna talk about positive results in this talk about cases where you can optimize. For this, I want to consider 
a more general class of models. These are called the mixed p spin models in physics. And they are simply uh, linear combinations of the pure models. So here the, C, the coefficient ci are just deterministic uh, numbers that determine your problem. And the game is as before, we take n to infinity, we get as an input the coefficient from all of these polynomials, and we want to produce a point close to the maximum. And just as an example, I'll, I'll talk about this situation soon. Uh, we should expect to optimize at least when C2 is very large compared to the other, score, to the other coefficients. Because in this case, most of the weight is on the easy problem. So if, if C2 is, is very large and all the other coefficients are tiny, you should expect to be able to say something. Okay, and uh, here's the main theorem I want to talk about. So I need to assume a certain condition. I need to assume that the support of the Parisi measure at zero temperature is the interval zero one. And I will not define what this means exactly, but I will tell you what it implies in terms of the, some geometric properties of the function HN. Uh, and also this condition is equivalent to an explicit condition in terms of those coefficients CK. You just construct this uh, polynomial in one variable, a deterministic polynomial, nu, which is called a mixture, and you check whether this condition holds, whether this function here is concave on the interval. If you don't know anything about spin glasses, you can just replace this condition by this explicit condition and get a theorem that doesn't uh, require any knowledge about spin glasses. And under this assumption, what we have is that for any epsilon, uh, there's an algorithm with complexity constant that depends on epsilon times n to the p, which outputs a point on the sphere, which is maximal up to this epsilon error. Uh, just a small remark about the complexity, the number of coefficients you have in the definition of Hn is uh, of the order of the number of coefficients of H and P, which is exactly N to the P. So your input is of these orders and you cannot expect to do any better than this. So this is a minimal complexity. And, okay, so just to uh, give you some feel about what this condition means, first, if you just do the compute, it's, uh, it's a simple problem to understand when, when it holds, but uh, so it's just some algebra, but if you check it, you'll see that this condition never holds if C2 is equal to zero. So you need some weight on the easy problem. And if C2 and C3 are positive, but all the other ones are zero, then still you cannot solve this problem, even if C2 is huge and C3 is tiny. And moreover, in the last case where you have a positive C2 and another, const, another CI which is positive for I larger than four, uh, if you fix the coefficient C3 to Cp, they will determine a certain threshold and this condition uh, will hold if and only if C2 is larger than this threshold. Okay, so, we, so essentially we can solve uh, the problem in the situation I said before, when C2 is large enough. And I want to mention a, a similar result in the, in the easing case. Uh, so this is actually two results. The first is by Andrea, uh, essentially immediately after this result. And uh, Andrea, Andrea's result is about the SK model. So this is for optimization uh, over the hypercube, we call it easing spins, uh, specifically for the case where H, the pure case with P equal to, that's the SK model. Uh, and more recently, Ahmed, Andrea, and uh, Mark Selke proved a more general result, which uh, allows you to prove under this assumption about the support of the Parisi measure, uh, allows you, it shows that you can optimize using a certain AMP algorithm. 
And regarding negative results, uh, so in the same work, they show that they get, uh, they show that the energy that until which you can optimize or the best MP algorithm will produce a certain energy, which uh, they uh, write as a certain variational problem. And you need to check whether it matches the Parisi formula for the maximum energy. And if not, then the algorithm, any, algo any AMP algorithm will fail in the sense that I wrote here, any algorithm will produce a point which will be smaller than a fraction of the maximum. Uh, and also there's, there's a result by David and Okosh Jagannath about AMP in the pure P spin model uh, with P even louder than four. Uh, and uh, an even more recent result together with Alex Wein, they show that low degree polynomials fail for the same models. Okay, so for the rest of the talk, I want to uh, explain, tell you what the algorithm is and show you how it naturally arises from some properties. Um, and the first thing I want to show you, to tell you about is this ultrametric tree, which is a famous result in spin glasses. And what it says is that not necessarily assuming the full RSP, uh, the, the condition I had about the, the Parisi measure for any model or any generic models, the probability it goes to one, there exists a tree with some properties and this tree is its vertices are, are points in the ball, in the unit ball. Specifically, the root is at the origin and the leaves are points on the sphere of radius one. And the first property it has is that any two edges on this tree are orthogonal. So that's a geometric property of the tree. And the second uh, property is maximality of the energy. So again, for any, now for any vertex on the tree, the energy at the vertex properly normalized by N is equal to the maximal energy over the corresponding sphere, the sphere of the same radius up to small errors. And lastly, and this is the relation to the Parisian, Parisian measure, uh, this, the number of levels on this tree depends on the size of the support of the Parisian measure. So in the so-called KRSB situation, we have a tree of depth K. And in the situation I'm interested in, where the support is the interval zero one, the number of levels will go to infinity as N goes to infinity. And asymptotically, you'll have vertices at any radius between zero and one. So what you should imagine is some, essentially a continuous object in the limit. It has this nice orthogonality property and more, and, and the second uh, property, which will be very important for optimization is that over this huge structure, the energy is consistently maximal. And what the algorithm will do is try to use this uh, information. Let me just remark that what we want is one of the orange points, the points on the sphere of radius one. And we're going to use the structure of this street to get to one of them. Yeah, of course, the fact that this tree exists doesn't help me directly. I can't just, uh, my algorithm cannot pick a point from the tree because this tree is random. Uh, Elrond, quick question. So this tree mm -hmm. has, this tree has N vertices or uh, N plus one vertices? No, the number of, you mean, you're talking about bounds because of the fact that the edges are orthogonal because of the dimensionality? Right. I mean, then, so you can take the number of vertices on the tree to go to infinity slowly with n, and if I if, because of this orthogonality property, of course I can stick too many points with this orthogonality in n dimensions. I, I thought I thought in Ahmed's talk he said he gave the weaker property that each edge is orthogonal to the previous edges on the path from it to the root but you're saying it, it, that all of the edges are mutually orthogonal. Yes. Uh, yes, uh, they're all orthogonal. 
but but uh, what I need to use is just a tree which is infinite in the limit. So for me, any number that goes to infinity with n is okay. Um, this construction follows from the famous ultrametricity uh, property that uh, Dmitry Pachenko proved. And the maximality here is a more recent result from the work I have uh, related to the TAP approach. So, okay, Eliran, if so, if I might follow up uh, on Chris' question. So, should I think of this as a double limit? That first I take n to infinity and the number of branches in the tree is fixed, and then I take the number of branches larger and larger, and then there is the near orthogonality and near maximality. Maybe yes. orthogonality and near maximality. Exactly. It, you should think you can think of fixed k for the number of vertices, and then uh, take it, k to infinity after n goes to infinity. Um, okay. So now I want to look at one path from this tree, and just will inherit the same properties we just saw, uh, but I want to make it explicit. So I take a path from this tree and it's essentially, uh, um, technically it's discrete. So I'm going to interpolate it uh, linearly between the points. The number of, uh, of segments on this path will go to infinity as n goes to infinity in, in the full RSV case. Uh, and I interpolate it so that at time Q, uh, the radius is square root Q. And because of the orthogonality on the tree, for this path, any segment is going to be orthogonal to the current position because it's orthogonal to all previous segments. And it also has this uh, uh, control over the energy. The energy is consistently maximal in, the, in this sense. It's uh, just the maximal energy of, on the corresponding radius. Now, what I want to do is forget about the uh, ultrametric tree and think of how I can construct such a path by myself. Okay, so, so assume that somebody tells you in the full RSP, we have many paths like this. And now, what you need to think of is how you would construct such a path by yourself with these two properties. And the first property we can just impose. So just create this path by concatenating many directions, which we force to be orthogonal at each point to the current position. So I'm thinking of choosing them iteratively. And at each step, I'm going to take them to be orthogonal to the current position. And what I need to understand now is how I choose them so that I maximize the energy at this step. We know that we also maximize it locally. So the algorithm should choose locally. Now, the first observation you should make is that if you can construct this path up to time i, what should happen is that you'll end up with a point which the energy is maximal. Therefore, the gradient on the orthogonal space should be zero because you are at the maximal energy on the corresponding sphere. Therefore, the gradient of the sphere and also in Rn on the orthogonal plane is going to be roughly zero. So we can't use the gradient and the second best, so, so we need to uh, increase the approximation to a second order approximation, sorry. And what we're going to do is just go in a direction which corresponds to one of the large eigenvalues of the Hessian restricted to the tangent space. Okay, so any, anything in the span of the large the eigenvalues, eigenvectors corresponding to the largest eigenvalues will work. So here's the algorithm uh, explicitly. I fix some number of steps K, which is going to be large and some small delta, which will be an arrow, which I'll allow, uh, which you see in a second. And I, as you remember, I construct the path from the origin outside. So I initialize the origin. And at each iteration, I'm going to choose a direction, a vector of length one, which is orthogonal to my current position. 
for simplicity, I will also take it to be orthogonal to the gradient. We know that the gradient is supposed to be zero, so I might as well take it orthogonal. And all I want, and, and this is the important thing, I want the second order term in a, a Taylor expansion around my location to be almost maximal over all use which satisfy these uh, constraints. Okay, and here's the this delta. And then I simply take a small step in this direction. The size of the step is such that after k steps, you'll end up exactly on the sphere of radius one. Okay, this is, v is orthogonal to xi, so it's clear how the radius goes. And what you can check is that the energy on this path with high probability will be maximal as we want up to an error epsilon, which is as small as we wish, provided k is large and delta is small. I will tell you in a second uh, why the two. Um, you can also check that the complexity of each iterate is some constant that depends on delta and the size of your input. Uh, all the, the complexity is essentially of computing the, this uh, Hessian, and then you just do power iteration to get the vector, to get the vector V. You just do power iteration on the orthogonal space. This will be enough because we only need uh, to, to find V with a delta error. And the last thing I want to tell you about is the proof because it's quite easy if you, once you have all the insights and you realize what the, the right algorithm should be, the proof is uh, quite simple. And it goes like this. So I have this path, which is by itself random, and I want to control the energy on this path, which sounds like bad news, but it's not because for these models, we can actually control the Hessian uniformly over the ball in the sense, uh, in not a very strong sense, but enough for what we need. And the statement is that with high probability uh, for all the points in the ball, if I look at the edge of the spectrum of this Hessian, it will roughly be this specific value. This function nu is the mixture. It was constructed from the coefficients in the linear combinations of the pure models. So that's an explicit function that is determined by the problem. And then if I want to understand how the energy evolves at each step, I just tell or expand. And so this is the zero order term, the energy at the point I'm at. The, set, the first order term will uh, vanish because we're choosing a direction orthogonal to the gradient. And the second term is exactly what we get from this proposition. And the third order term, the error term will be of smaller order in K. And as you take k to infinity, what you'll get is just an approximation of this Riemann integral. And so this is the energy for this path. And actually from the Parisi formula, we know that for models where the Parisi measure is a zero one interval, you can just plug it into the Parisi formula and get the value of the maximum. And this is exactly this value. And that's all I wanted to say. Uh, so if it's not a full support, so that does that mean that nu of q at some point is zero so that you don't gain an increment in the energy with this orthogonal move? Is that so that the algorithm gets stuck in a sense? Is that what happens when there's a gap? No. So what happens is that for any model, the energy I wrote here is the energy you get with this algorithm or any without any assumption because this proposition is general. So just apply it for any model and this is what you get. But for any model which for which this new double prime to the minus f is not concave, this will not be the right energy. So for example, in the pure case, what will happen is that you get to the energy uh, where you start to see local maxima. So you'll, you'll achieve the energy, the, the, the same kind of thing that Ahmed told us where you achieve the energy corresponding to the, the optimal uh, monotone function new. So in the spherical case, the, uh, the best achievable value uh, 
uh, with AMP from the work of uh, Ahmed, uh, Andrea, and, and Mark is exactly this value. The spherical case, you can just solve the uh, variational problem, and this is what you get. So this is the, the same as the best AMP algorithm. Thank you very much. So we have time for some questions. I'm watching the chat and the Q&A on Zoom. I don't see questions coming in just yet. Any questions from anyone? I'll ask a trivial question just to make sure I'm following. In the pure case, uh, all the spheres are the, like inside spheres are the same, right? I mean, this maximality yes. property, that's right? Yes. Okay, just to make sure I check, got it. Also, maybe I can ask, uh, how much does it rely on the coefficients being Gaussian? Like, does it also, uh, something similar work for non-Gaussian uh, other distribution like coefficients? I assume that yes, I didn't check, but you need to verify that this proposition holds. There are universality results for, for the Parisi formula, so this part is okay. And yes, I think yes, because you don't need too much about, uh, you don't need, I mean, for the uniform result, I'm using some bounds which require large deviations for the empirical measure of the, of the spectrum of a GOE matrix. You need something to substitute for this to get to, to be able to, to have uniform bounds for the entire ball. Uh, and I'm not sure for which matrices we have this. Okay, but probably for like some reasonable coefficient distributions, it should be fine. Yes, uh, I hope. <laughs> So a comment there is that for, so the large deviation principle, you only need the speed to be n squared. You don't care about the rate function, right? The rate function right. will not be universal, but the speed will be universal. Right, you're right. I don't, I don't use the full uh, large deviation principle. I only use the fact that uh, bad events on the order of the empirical measure happen with speed that uh, is larger than n. Anything larger than n for, this event, for events of this type would be sufficient. Yeah, but isn't there something a little bit tricky? I, I, you know, it's, it's sure that this works, but you know, the Eschen, in the, in the Gaussian case, the Eschen is a GOE matrix. In the non-Gaussian case, I think the Eschen doesn't have IAD entries, does it? Because in the, in, I think in the Gaussian case, you are using the fact that if you rotate a GOE, you get a GOE. If you rotate a matrix, a Wigner matrix, you don't. Yes, you are. So, but yeah, I mean, should work. I, yeah, I don't have an immediate uh, answer for this, but uh, yes. Um, but maybe you can control. Yes. Any other questions for Elran? Uh, oh, go ahead, David. Yeah. Uh, this is marginally related, but what's known about if, if the, the the concavities for the pairwise overlap support, right? Uh, that's supposed to describe also the pairwise overlap. Is this, what's known about multi-overlap support? So if I take many replicas in spherical models and I look at the matrix of overlaps, is it supposed to span the entire cube or when, when the pairwise overlap is uh, described by concave function or there's something more intricate? Yeah, it's a, it, for any, for generic models, uh, the, the parisim and the, the distribution of the, just a pair of overlaps determines the, this array of all overlaps. And it will be the same as uh, a well probability cascade, some, some structure that uh, uh, with the corresponding Distribution. So this distribution actually determines the whole distribution of the whole array. In, in That's right. It does determine, determine because of the Gaussianity, which just depends on the covariances. But uh, what's what's known about this multi-overlap, uh, the support of the multi-overlap distribution? Is it just a cube, or could it be more complicated? Then? You mean in the spherical case? Let's say in the spherical case. Let's say in the concave uh, when the Overlap second derivative square root is concave in, in your setting. So any so if you're in the full RSV case, anything that satisfies ultrametricity is okay. Any 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 array of all the overlaps that that respects ultrametricity can be sampled. 
Okay, multi IC. Okay, good. And then we also have the. This is essential. So this follows from Girlanda Guerra and the automaticity. Uh, we have an explicit uh, description for the whole uh, for the distribution of this array with okay. probabilities. Yeah, I mean, not just. Okay. Thanks. I'll just ask like one more question as like a dumb guy that doesn't follow these things too much. Uh, so if I understand correctly, like the, the ultra matricity result in the tree, this is all like inspiration. And like in the end, like the only thing that you kind of use from uh, this body of knowledge is the Parisi formula right here on the slide. Yes, okay. you can also, uh, you can also even if you, there is a way to prove this even without the Parisi formula, if you assume some structural thing from the tree, you can actually uh, avoid using the Parisi formula. I yeah, mean, if you assume curious, what this EG meant, like, you know, you could use a Parisi formula, but what's the other thing? I mean, there's something okay. else you can do. <laughs> yeah. Uh, that's why I wrote it actually, because there is a, because you can, uh, you can use ultrametricity directly as a property and, and get, and, and, and there's a geometric explanation why this actually has to be the value without actually appealing to Parisi's formula. But it does require ultrametricity, which is a heavy result. But is that I mean, easier to, I mean, I guess it's easier to prove? What, ultrametricity? Yeah. Not really. It's, um, okay, <laughs> they're all hard, yeah, okay. Um, Editor, maybe I can ask, this is just wondering. So does it make sense to ask a similar question in the context of slightly more complicated models like pot spin glasses and stuff? And, and what should be expected in these settings? Uh, I have, I, I don't have a good answer, but except for when you can analyze, so when you can analyze the, the top uh, approach properly and you have ultrametricity, then what should happen is, that, so this property of the tree, for example, in the easing case, this maximality is replaced by a maximum, instead of the energy of, on both sides, you should add a top correction. So some deterministic function, which uh, I will not explain what it is, but uh, in the easing case, this is what will be maximized over the tree. And I think that this is more general, but for example, when you have photometricity, uh, there should be something like this hiding but I don't have uh, a more refined statement of this. Okay, so how about we take a five minute break and we'll come back at 9.40 for Pacific time for Stefano, uh, Stefano's talk, Stefano Sarao Manelli. So thank you very much. Let's thank Eleran again. Thank you.